Good morning. Good morning. How you doing today? Hopefully well. Well, and uh, so in continuing in our Luke study, Jesus is, uh, well, let me start by first saying that uh, there's quite a gap here that I just thought I would briefly uh, mention. Uh, again, Luke's emphasis is on Jesus the man. So it's not so much as uh, on his, all four Gospels take a different approach. And I'm starting to see even more now as I studied Luke, that uh, it definitely comes from the standpoint of Jesus as the man, and not so much his ministry as much. Uh, it's more about him personally than, than some of the other Gospels that talk more about uh, his ministry when it comes to the disciples. So let me get, uh, let me start with a word of prayer. Oh dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, we love you so much and thank you so much for the, for the Gospels and for this thorough understanding of you and uh, what we need to know about you at this time frame in our lives. Now we give you praise and thanks, Lord, so much uh, for these wise words we get to see inside uh, your son Jesus and that we can get to be more like him in his uh, dealings with human beings, and that we can be more like him. And Lord, I know I need a lot of help in that area. So be with me and give me all the blessings you can to help me be a better follower of you. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. So I was gonna say is, uh, 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 as we come into this section, uh, we're going to be in Luke 4, verse 22 to 30 today. And I uh, just wanted to mention that most of the first three chapters, almost no, four chapters of John, uh, have, uh, have, are passed by in this, in this few verses here in Luke. And so I uh, just wanted to briefly say what's not in Luke in this section that you're finding John. And basically in John 1, 29 through 51, John 2, 1 through 25, John 3, 1 through 36, and John 4, 1 through 54. Uh, that general area talks a lot about what else was going on in this time frame uh, with uh, Jesus picking uh, five of the disciples, uh, Andrew, Simon, which is later known as Peter, James and John, plus Nathaniel. Uh, got the wedding at Cana, where he turned water into wine. That's in John, uh, the first Passover. That famous uh, chapter three in John, where Nicodemus and Jesus talk on the hilltop and on the top of the uh, uh, house there about uh, being born again. And also the woman at the well in Samaria. So all that's kind of uh, transpired between his being in the, uh, in the uh, desert, being tempted by Christ, and where we are right now. So I just wanted to give you an idea on the time frame. So let's bring in our uh, our picture here. And I forgot to get our little pointer. I got this little one. Maybe you can see it. I can change it real quick. But uh, Okay, now I got the big pointer. Oh, not as big. I missed something. Yeah, there's the big one. Okay. So there's a big pointer. And so the last time we talked about Jesus in that center here, when he read through that scroll, and he basically announced to his, he's, at, he's in the synagogue in Nazareth, by the way, so he basically announced to all of his town folks that knew him uh, that he was God. And so we're, in the opening statement here in verse 22, we're going to see that Jesus, uh, that everybody's questioning, isn't this just Joseph's son? You know, uh, so they, they're having trouble believing him uh, for sure. And so Jesus is kind of going to kind of try to explain him a little bit carefully, uh, but they get more irate and want to uh, basically throw him off a cliff. Uh, which we'll get into uh, during this phase. 
And that's where you see these pictures up here. Uh, kind of is the section that we're going to be talking about today. So let's start reading. And, uh, and all bear him witness and wondering at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Maybe I should back up one verse just so you know where we're coming from. This is what, where we left off. And he began to say unto them, this day, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So basically he just announced to them that he was God and not so many words. And so again, uh, and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And talking about Joseph's son, uh, over in John 6.42, they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it that he said, I came down from heaven? Uh, this is another version of, uh, in John, of this same event. So you can see that uh, uh, they definitely uh, thought that he was basically saying that he came down from heaven. And so Jesus is going to go on and explain a couple of things to him. And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whosoever we have heard done in Copernicum, do also here in thy country. I got the impression here that he could sense, oh, I got too many of me's up there. Let me get one of the me's. There we are. Uh, I can definitely get the sense that Jesus is sensing uh, that uh, the people uh, don't believe him, number one, uh, and that uh, uh, and that he's making this up for whatever reason. And basically to, uh, only in for it for what they can get out of it. Because maybe they'd already heard, and I'm going to show you here in a minute, uh, talking about Copernicum. And... Uh, uh, Because they go on along, uh, along that same lines, the Pharisees. Remember, he's in a synagogue, so there's a Pharisee, there's a uh, there's a there's a uh, a temple priest there. The Pharisees really did not either understand what to expect when Christ first coming, or enjoyed their lives and power too much to to be watching for him. Uh, so let's look at a few verses that talk about this. I had just read this one about John. Uh, I mean, no, I didn't. Luke six forty two. Either how canst thou say to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thy own eye? Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thy own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. Uh, and, I, and by this verse, uh, basically, uh, kind of in what Jesus is saying here in Luke also, is that... Uh, Position, heal thyself. Uh, I mean, uh, he's basically saying to them that uh, they need to uh, heal. The, they need to get with reality and realize that all the teachings of the prophets are coming true now. But your eyes are <laughs> blinded to what's going on. And over in Romans, uh, Paul mentions uh, in chapter two, verse twenty-one and twenty-two, "Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself that thou." Preaches a man should not steal, dost thou steal? I was do it, do it. Thou that thou sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? That thou abhor uh, abhorous idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? So, in other words, uh, they're making, uh, he's making a claim, and the claim is true, and they're doubting his words. Uh, so, they're basically uh, they're calling him a liar. Uh, and so he's basically coming back at them and saying that, uh, uh, like many prophets, that you don't believe me, and that uh, I'm not explaining it very well. I don't think. It seems to me. Hopefully, that makes sense. Uh, maybe this verse here will help. It's over in Matthew 11:23 and 24, because he, he mentioned Copernicum, and I guess uh, he, prior to this event, uh, he had healed a bunch of people up in Copernicum. And it's mentioned in uh, Matthew 11. 
And thou, Copernicum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. <clears throat> so that Jesus is basically saying here that you want to see a sign, you want to see a miracle, uh, but that uh, you won't believe my words, but if I perform miracles, uh, then you'll believe. And all you really care about is the miracle, not, not what, what my message is. And that's the kind of impression I get anyways. Okay, back to Luke 4.24. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. So I think it's more about <clears throat> that he's just not plain not accepted in his own country. And that uh, uh, he, he's hoping, I guess, that they'll believe his words. But that uh, really, they weren't really wanting to necessarily... Uh, now, of course, there's exceptions, because, uh, of course, we had the 12 disciples who uh, really loved following him. Uh, we had plenty of people that did follow him, thousands, uh, you know, the feeding of the 5,000, and there'll be plenty more. Uh, but it seems like the hierarchy of the Jewish nation was more concerned about their worldly ways and their power, and they were about uh, watching for the Messiah, which was, pro uh, was, was prophesied way back in uh, uh, all the Old Testament books. And what he had just finished reading was the Isaiah account of there's going to be a Messiah. There's going to be someone coming to heal. Maybe I need to go back and just read that real quick. Just read that real quick, and it kind of gives a help a little bit of a better understanding. This is what Jesus read uh, out of Isaiah: "The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives." recover of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And realize that uh, the year of the Lord was uh, was a time frame in the future uh, where uh, God was going to take back the world uh, from uh, from evil. So a lot of them understood what that meant, but he, as he continues on, they're getting uh, upset with him because he's claiming to be that person. But that they've already seen, they've already heard from Copernicum that uh, some miracles were done there. And he's, uh, he's, uh, his, uh, uh, we had already mentioned that uh, that he was becoming known around the area for healing. Well, if he's doing all these things, it says in Isaiah, uh, then why don't they believe that he's the Messiah? And that's where he's kind of getting at is that they don't believe him, uh, that he could be the Messiah because uh, he was from their town. Uh, you know, that uh, they knew him, uh, they commented, they knew their, his father. And uh, so he ends up by saying, Barely I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Uh, this is also mirrored over in Mark 6, 4 and 5. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could... They do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. Uh, so that uh, he's basically not going to try to convince them by uh, by doing a bunch of healing here, because they should believe him already, uh, based on the verses he just read. So I hope that uh, understands, uh, makes it understand a little bit better, easier to understand. At first, I was confusing myself, to tell you the truth. Okay, on to verse 25. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But none, but unto none of them was Elias say, sent, save unto Serpita, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. Uh, let me explain this woman. This, uh, this Sidon was an area of uh, the Gentiles. Uh, she was a, uh, a Gentile, not a Jewish woman. And so Jesus is going to use this story to point out the fact that because uh, uh, the, other, the other problem the Jewish people had is they had a really a hatred for anybody who was not a Jew. Uh, and that was part of the animosity. If you remember the woman at the well scenario uh, that uh, uh, people avoided Samaria because of the Samaritans were a mixed breed kind of. 
when they were taken over by the Assyrians, uh, the northern kingdom was taken over by the Assyrians about the same time as the Babylonian, uh, just before the Babylonian Empire took this, uh, Judea, the southern kingdom. They were actually, the Assyrians had a way of mixing people in with other cultures. Uh, so that basically they became a mixed race of Jewish and Gentile uh, marriages so that uh, the offspring that were now in uh, Samaria uh, were basically not purebred Jewish. And so there was a great hatred. And so that's what Jesus is kind of pointing out here. Uh, and he's going to point out here it's about this woman that uh, during this famine, and by the way, uh, Elijah was the one that actually started the, the uh, drought based on what uh, King Ahab was doing at the time frame. We see this over this story over in 1 Kings, and I thought I'd read, read, read through parts of it briefly. It's pretty much the whole chapter of uh, 1 Kings 17 uh, and, and into chapter 18. But I'll just pick out a few key verses to get the uh, gist of it. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was an inhabitant of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be a dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And so basically that because uh, uh, Ahab did not uh, repent and bowed and, uh, and turn his turn back to God, that there was going to be no rain in the land. So that's basically what the time frame we're talking about. I'm going to jump down to verse 8. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, this is, to, uh, this is Elijah now. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon. Zidon and Sidon, uh, the, uh, uh, one's the Old Testament, one's New Testament, it's the same place. And dwell there, behold, I have commanded a, a widow woman there to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks, that he and he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going, for, uh, going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil and a curse. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. They were very, very poor. And she was down to her last meal. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as I have said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the curse, a cruse of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. Now we'll talk about faith. That's true faith. And she and he and her house did eat many days. In other words, that meal, every day she went to it, there was enough there for that day. And the Lord provided for her. Uh, great story. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the curse of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. So that's the story Jesus is talking about here. And he's going to end up. So I'm going to tell one more story here in a second. Uh, just to confirm this, so I'm going to mention uh, about the rain missing. James, who is the brother of Jesus, uh, in, five, in James 5.17 said, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. I'll tell you how long that barrel of, oil, that barrel of uh, a meal in oil lasted. Three and a half years. Okay, back to Luke, uh, verse four, chapter four, verse twenty-seven. And this is the second story. Uh, so the first story here, we got uh, a point to it. As a widow woman here, you see Elijah went, uh, met up with her, and you can see her cooking the, uh, cooking the, uh, with her son over in the corner, and then she believed him. And, she st and uh, he stayed with her that whole time praying. So back to uh, the next story. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of uh, Elushas the prophet, and none of them 
was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. Now, this is an interesting story. This is the, the next two slides over here. Naaman the Syrian was another Gentile, uh, and uh, he was sick in bed with the palsy. And so he had sent one of his, uh, I'll read it here in a minute, it's in 2 Kings. But he sent one of his uh, people, uh, one of his servants, to Elijah uh, to uh, see if he would come and cleanse him. And Elijah said, uh, and Elijah, uh, the uh, servant went to go talk to Elijah and came back. Elijah didn't come back with him <coughs> and tells the servant, go dip yourself <coughs> in the Jordan River seven times. So let's pick up the story in 2 Kings 5.1. This is a little bit lengthy. It goes all the way to, it's actually longer. I'm going to read 15 verses, but uh, it's actually even more than that. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. And he was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by company and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And so the, this uh, Samaria, remember I was telling you that uh, Samaria was not a place where most Jewish people went. Uh, so it's talking about Elijah, though. Elijah at this time frame is in Samaria, with, uh, I think, with this woman. But it could have been, uh, it could have been uh, someplace else, but in Samaria anyways. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus, and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Israel said, Go, go, to go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten charges of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have thee, the, uh, therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God, to kill and to make alive, that this man does send unto me to recover a man of leprosy? Leprosy was not curable, uh, typically, back then. Wherefore, consider, I pray ye, uh, and see how he might uh, he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so when Elijah, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall now know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. Okay, that's this picture here. So that must be Elijah. And that's the king there. So I got it a little bit backwards. And Elijah sent a messenger unto him. Oh, no, no, that's the messenger. Never mind. So that's Elijah sending the messenger to him. That's what it is. Elijah sent a messenger unto him saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. And there's a picture of uh, uh, Jordan River, most likely. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought uh, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. So he's expecting some big elaborate uh, uh, raising of hands and touching of hands and uh, so on and so forth. So Naaman wasn't quite expecting that quite of a response. Are not uh, Abana and uh, Phiphar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. One of his servants, smart man, and his servant came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, would thou have done it? How much rather than when he says to thee, wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was cleaned. 
And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth, but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. He wants to offer him gold and all kind of stuff. And, uh, and basically, uh, uh, Elijah says to uh, give it to the poor, I think. If you want to finish reading it, it's the rest of the chapter 5 of Second Kings. So you get the gist of the idea anyways. So these are the two stories that Jesus told. They're both about Gentiles. So, of course, this, this gets them even more irate because the Jewish people don't like the Gentiles. Uh, they think that they're uh, barbarians or whatever they want to call them. And so uh, moving back into Luke 428. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And this is the beginning of the process because I, I can see there, here that uh, uh, this is Jesus doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing, but it's leading towards the fact that they're going to want to crucify him because he's going to, they feel he's going against God uh, by saying all these things. But he's doing exactly what the Bible said he was supposed to do. <laughs> Interesting. But over in Luke 6, 11, and they were filled with madness and commuted one another what they might do to Jesus. So that was their uh, uh, marching orders. In the background, the Pharisees are going, we can't let this guy continue. He's he's uh, he's going to uh, get the people against us. You know. So verse 40, 29. He rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of a hill whereupon the city was built that they might cast him down headlong. And so that's what we see over here. Right, leading, leading him up to the hill to the top. And I just want to point out a couple of things here. And to realize that, that Jesus has come to fulfill prophecy of all the Old Testament saints. And that it, it was really important that he fulfilled all the prophecies. Or people today would probably say that Jesus was a fake. Because he didn't fulfill this prophecy or that prophecy. So that there's no way that he could die according to the crowd's timing. It had to be according to what the prophets had said all the years prior to now. So I thought I'd point out a couple other times that this happened. In Luke 17, 25, uh, another time frame, they tried to kill him. But first must, uh, but first must he suffer many things and, and be rejected of his generation. Oh, this is one more verse about the rejection. And a couple of more on rejection over in John 8, 37. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. That's uh, another place. Uh, also, John 10, 31. Then he took, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Uh, so some other times that they tried to kill him. But it was really important that, the, that, again, that Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies. So he had to die uh, based on uh, the way he did, uh, with a sac as a sacrificial lamb on, pa on, uh, on the correct day uh, that the, the sacrifice was given. Uh, and and he had to die at the hands of uh, uh, their uh, crucified. Because it even talks about that in one of the Psalms. So in Luke 4.30. So th again, this time even he, he, he uh, I'm thinking he kind of makes himself almost invisible and disappears uh, from, the, from the crowd and, go, and walks through them. Because he says, but he passing through the midst of them went his way. So somehow they didn't see him actually used to leave. And just to finish off here, I realize that Jesus had a mission that he had to, like again, uh, finish his course. And one of the main verses of this is in Daniel 9:26. Let me just read it real quick. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end there shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war. The part I'm talking about here is, and after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. <clears throat> well, if you calculate out that three score in two weeks, it came to exactly the day that he was presented as the perfect sacrificial lamp on Palm Sunday, the week he was crucified. So he had a date and he had to meet that date. So there's no way he could have died early. <clears throat> but also in John 8, 59. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them as so passed by. So this is another place where 
<coughs> and also in John 10 39 therefore they sought again to take him but he escaped out of their hand so he kept uh, avoiding being killed because he had to be crucified at a certain date plus fulfill all the prophecies that he had to fulfill and there's a bunch more of the passion week that he had to fulfill, had to, fulfill uh, to meet all the requirements of the old testament so that makes him the only person that could actually be the Messiah. And so that's what I got for today. And we'll end there. And uh, I'll end with a word of prayer. <clears throat> oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, so much for this time that we got the chance to look at your word. And thank you, Lord, uh, for all the things that you show us and all the things we learn about you. Looking forward to that day, Lord, when we get to uh, see you in person and that we can be with you forever. And uh, we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Okay, we'll talk all again tomorrow. Have a great day.